This is Macroview Television, and thank you for tuning in to a brand new edition of Taiwan Outlook, the program that presents the different faces and lets you hear the different voices on Taiwan. I'm your host, Ray Guo. Do you enjoy watching documentary films? What does it take to make a documentary film? On today's program, we're going to find out because we're delighted to have a true expert on the documentary filmmaking. And he is Mr. Al Go, who's currently the executive producer for Taiwan and China at the National Geographic Channel. Welcome to the program, Al. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the program. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the program, Al. Thank you. First off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure, sure. Uh, I've been in Taiwan for two years. My wife is Taiwanese, Good. Uh, okay. but I was born in Japan. Okay. And I'm half Chinese, half Japanese. Okay. Uh, my father is Malay Chinese. And, Good. Um, he went to college in Japan mm -hmm. and uh, met my mother. Okay. And uh, I was born and I moved to the U.S. when I was 13 years old. So Good. I spent half my childhood in Japan, half uh -huh. in in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. and uh, after I uh, graduated from college in the U.S. I went straight to China and spent a good, uh, good 14 years about. Yeah, that's a uh, long time, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a big place, <laughs> yes. lots to do. Yes, and Al, we understand that you're also mm -hmm. very international in terms of your education background mm -hmm. because you went to school, like you said, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. at the age of 13 mm -hmm. and you ended up you know, getting your bachelor's degree from my alma mater, mm -hmm. University of California, Berkeley, in East Asian Studies. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you went on to Tsinghua University mm -hmm. in Beijing, China, and studied Chinese literature. Do you think that the international flavor of your education and your background can certainly be a plus in terms of your subsequent you know, career choices. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I think um, what my background gives me is an ability to triangulate. Okay. Uh, so I Good. come from different sort of, I can see different perspectives. Mm. Uh, I can gauge them and then okay. try to find a middle ground. All right. uh, and for me, that's where maybe the truth is and exactly. the reality. Uh, and so um, it's been, it's been a, a very useful sort mm -hmm. of um, background and an educational mm -hmm. sort of process. And Good. I think this um, process continues as I learn more about filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And now I've moved on a little bit more to teaching others. And I try to um, pass that um, ability or how can I put it? Mm, expertise. Maybe expertise yeah, yeah. or uh, knowledge. Uh, that sort of sense yes. of how to look at things. I, right. I think that's what documentaries boil down to. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something generic. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your opinion, and based on your years of you know, experience as a you know, filmmaker, mm -hmm. what does it take? What are the qualities you deem necessary mm -hmm. to be a you know, successful documentary filmmaker? Mm -hmm. I think um, first and foremost, I think curiosity. All right. um, you've got to be uh, curious about what's around you in this mm. world okay. and not take things for what they are Okay. Uh, it may seem one day, uh, one way, mm -hmm. but you have the drive to dig and find stuff out that actually, you know, makes things tick. Um, okay. And so that's, I think, the most basic, fundamental sort of drive for filmmakers, exactly. especially in documentaries. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, after you graduated from Tsinghua University in mm -hmm. Beijing, that you started working for Reuters Video News. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell us a little bit why, you know, based on the, you know, uh, sociological and the literature background that you study in, you know, university and graduate school, mm -hmm. that you decided to join a, you know, news organization? Mm -hmm. Actually, it was a, um, it was a fluke. Um, oh. I had no intention of <laughs> um, joining news. Often people okay. in this industry, um, stumble upon this okay. you know, profession or career. Uh -huh. And so um, I was doing uh, graduate studies in Tsinghua and yes. one of my classmates uh, had a friend who was working at Reuters. Okay. And it just happened that there was an internship there. And so I thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll go and give it a try. Because I'm in China. I've, been, I've always been interested in China. Mm -hmm. um, and it would provide me a new way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went and I thought, you know, it was going to be this big uh, job interview. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, I wore my tie, went in, saw the <laughs> boss, and they spoke to me a few words, and they said, okay, you could start coming You're next hired? week. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I thought, oh, is that it? <laughs> okay. And um, that's how it started, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did you think that experience, mm -hmm. because you were there all the way to 2003, mm -hmm. and then did you think that experience helped you mm -hmm. in your subsequent career choices? Yeah, definitely. I okay. think um, China expanded and developed very mm -hmm. rapidly during mm -hmm. that period of time. Mm -hmm. And so um, news, I think, um, you know, you have to look at a lot of different topics mm -hmm. and you have to cover a lot of um, different things. And mm -hmm. so it gave me a very good foundation subsequently when I moved on to long form films of uh, to have a, 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 the breadth, okay. to, so to speak, right. um, understanding about China. All right. Mm -hmm. But uh, given the fact that uh, news, you know, stories mm -hmm. are generally fast paced, mm -hmm. you know, you need to cover something right away and get a send, you know, send out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a little different from, you know, making the subsequent like the documentary films that you made. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. did you think that the two trainings were actually compatible? Mm -hmm. you know, and complementary to each other? Or is it that one thing maybe help you prepare for the subsequent, you know, career choices that you made, but not just, you know, not necessarily helpful mm -hmm. in terms of getting you ready mm -hmm. for the next job. What do you think? I think news actually helped me a lot because oh, really? uh, you have to first understand the five W's, who, when, where, why, what. Okay. And so in documentary, those are the basic building blocks as well. Okay. Uh, and first you understand them, mm -hmm. and then you start to spin your story. Okay. So, and then you go into your storytelling. Okay, how do we tell the story? Characters, okay. uh, story arcs, so on and so forth. But uh, news provided me a very good um, foundation to understand things quickly mm. and in a thorough way. Okay. And then so that became the foundation. And then I built the storytelling on top of it cool. um, in my documentary filmmaking. Good. Mm -hmm. And Al, you have been with the National Geographic Channel for some years. Mm -hmm. You are now the executive producer mm -hmm. for Taiwan and China. What is your mission and your experience so far at the National Geographic Channel? Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the most important things is to mm -hmm. take local stories okay. and tell it to the world. Uh, recently, exactly. we had this series called Taiwan to the World. It's been an ongoing mm -hmm. initiative. Okay. Uh, and we try to train up local directors and production houses mm -hmm. in order to be able to tell local stories uh, and international quality. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that's, I think, one of our biggest missions because we feel that um, humans everywhere live under different circumstances. Uh, for instance, in mm -hmm. uh, the Middle East or US, Europe, Taiwan, China. But I, we believe, I, at least I believe there are hum human universals where despite the differences, a lot of the very basic human conditions, uh, feelings, um, psychology mm -hmm. are Oh, the same. Yes. And mm -hmm. so what we want, what I want to do personally is to mm -hmm. take these local stories in a way and tell it in a way that resonates with people elsewhere. Okay. And by doing that, I feel in my own little, you know, small way, I'm contributing to mm -hmm. understanding between cultures. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Al, we understand that, you know, in addition to your, you know, training, education being very international, mm -hmm. that National Geographic, you know, channel is also an international platform. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at the experiences in Taiwan, maybe over the last 20 or 30 years, you know, to be honest, you know, we have been somewhat internationally isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, Taiwan isn't uh, very visible on uh, some of the international developments and issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you mentioned earlier about you know, transforming local stories into something, you know, build on the National Geographic Channel platform mm -hmm. and make sure that others in other parts of the world can understand the stories. Mm -hmm. Do you find that, you know, transformation or the uh, uh, transition from the local story onto the international stage mm -hmm. somewhat you know, difficult or more difficult mm -hmm. than if you were asked to do the same task in a different place. Mm. Yeah, and at the same time, I think it's imperative that Taiwan continues to make these local films that can foreign audiences can see. Okay. Otherwise, its own uh, 
presence or yes. uh, profile in the whole you know, international sta stage yeah, will be diminished. Yes. And so mm -hmm. I, I think it's very important for Taiwan to use method, cultural methods like mm. documentary films or art, music, or whatever it is mm -hmm. to project its image to the world. Otherwise, it can easily be forgotten because of its uh, sort of the, its spa international space is yes. constantly limited to yes. the various circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, Taiwan, the biggest challenge is there are good stories, local mm -hmm. stories. Okay. Um, talent is there, and there's okay. a lot of passion mm -hmm. amongst the directors and production houses, but mm -hmm. funding is not so easy. Uh, where places like you know Singapore, U.S., uh, Canada, or even Australia, they have mm -hmm. uh, tax credits where you know the government helps invest in documentary projects. Mm -hmm. um, I wish that that kind of uh, program or public funding could yes. be improved in, Chi uh, in, Taiwan. in Taiwan, and it's okay. it's quite important because. Um, documentary is a very effective way to reach out to the rest of the world. Exactly. Mm. All right. And uh, before we end this part of the program, Mel, do you think our private sector, specifically the corporations, mm -hmm. have this sense, awareness, mm -hmm. about that we need to sponsor you know, programs and projects like yours mm -hmm. you know, to try to tell the Taiwan stories to the world? Larger corporations, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, recently we did, we did this film called The Terraced Fields. Okay. Um, it's about um, basically mm -hmm. rice fields up in the north of Taiwan uh -huh. and how they use very uh, eco-friendly ways of growing rice and Good. not disrupting mm -hmm. nature. And that mm -hmm. was sponsored by Wistron. Oh, uh, okay. And so um, some of the more enlightened um, mm -hmm. bosses, I think, in Taiwan for big uh -huh. corporations, uh, understand the need it, yeah, to the show importance. the good things about Taiwan. Mm. Uh, Not just locally, but to the world. To yes. the world, yeah, yes. that's very important. We need to take the, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the small, you know, uh, TV production company mm -hmm. that you once owned mm -hmm. before you joined National Geographic Channel. Uh, why did you set that up and what was the experience like? Mm. Uh, personally, that was because uh, I wanted to move out from uh, news completely okay. and concentrate my efforts on long-form documentaries mm, okay. uh, because for what for quite a long time I worked for the BBC mm. and I got to do a lot of documentaries and current affairs but mm -hmm. um, uh, there was still news responsibility okay. and I've been doing it for a very long time okay. and so I wanted to concentrate more on storytelling and so okay. uh, that was a uh, big step for me because yeah. um, I went from a very sort of a stable mm -hmm. uh, sort of BBC established yeah. job to <laughs> jump into the ocean to set up a small production company that also did stuff, did um, program, programming for mm -hmm. Discovery, mm -hmm. uh, National Geographic and um, BBC as well. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, how was the transition you mm -hmm. know, from your own production company and then onto National Geographic Channel? Mm -hmm. It's actually been very smooth because okay. we did quite a lot of content for National Geographic anyway okay. uh, during my okay. years mm -hmm. operating the um, production company. So okay. I knew what they wanted. And mm -hmm. so it was in some ways going from the production producer side to the client side in mm -hmm. some ways. And okay. so uh, it's been very helpful for me and for the, peop uh, for the production companies I deal with as well because I've been Good. in their shoes. Okay. And, and then in some ways, I had an idea, a good idea about what the job would entail okay. when, when I moved to National Geographic. Yeah, so in a sense, you have been on both sides of the fences. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the you know, uh, film projects that you have done. Mm -hmm. you know, first and foremost, we're going to talk about Toxic B, you know, Nature's May Day. You know, this is a joint project with PTS in Taiwan. And then why did you pick the topic? What was the significance to you personally behind, you know, looking at the bees, please. Sure. Uh, originally, um, this uh, CCD, Colony Collapse Disorder, okay. uh, materialized uh, in about 2006, the mid-2000s, and it okay. created a big sensation because suddenly, you know, overnight, I mean, millions of bees were dying, and what's going to happen to the world because bees pollinate more than maybe about 40% of all crops. So okay. what, ha what happens if they all died? Uh, and you know how how are the how is the human race going to cope? Yeah, respond. Uh, respond yeah. to the, mm -hmm. this uh, big threat. And so, um, in the very beginning, there were quite a few films that were made on it. 
but somehow we began to forget about it. Um, it seemed like life was going on as normal and we still got our food and the human race wasn't getting too affected. Uh -huh. But um, just recently, um, a Harvard professor, Alex Liu, uh, he uh, came up with a groundbreaking um, study linking the use of a per certain kind of pesticide to, mm. uh, to the massive death uh, okay. or CCD. Okay. Uh, and so uh, we thought this would be a new sort of beginning for this issue. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, a com it was a new way of thinking. It was actually, the hum humans were actually doing this onto nature. Okay. And then it came a full circle and it was coming back to haunt us mm -hmm. as human beings. Okay. Uh, and so we tried to take a fresh look at it. Uh, mm. We thought this, um, uh, this study was very interesting and we needed to pick the issue back up and let the public know actually this issue hasn't gone away. We need to continue to think about it because it's actually bees are very effective uh, detectors in nature. So they mm -hmm. go everywhere, they fly and wherever that you can find them in all sorts of different kinds of environments. So mm -hmm. whatever happens to them is a good indication of the things that are going wrong in nature. Okay. Uh, and so we tried to bring this uh, to people's attention okay. and that it wasn't just about the bees, but tiny, uh, minute, um, lethal, sub-lethal doses, mm -hmm. what we call, okay. are actually affecting human beings as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout the production mm -hmm. of the you know, to you know, toxic bee, mm -hmm. uh, did you, what was the connection that you discovered in terms of, you know, when we're looking at the bees, uh, look at how they work, how they behave, and we can subsequently learn about the changes that we see in the environment and which will have a very direct impact on human you know, health. Well, what's the connection that you have discovered? Sure, sure. I think um, since the Second World War, mm. the chemical industry has created a lot of new forms of pesticides, herbicides, and yes. they become more and more effective and less mm -hmm. and less toxic. Okay. And so before, if you sprayed you know, the fields, the insects or pests or whatever would die right away. Okay. Um, but now it happens in a more piecemeal, slow, slower fashion where okay. they, uh, the chemicals build up mm -hmm. and over time they manifest themselves okay. in, in negative ways. So mm -hmm. our sort of aim to show in this film was to show that um, just because you eat something or you do something and nothing happens right away, okay. if you keep doing that over time, mm -hmm. the effect will build up and it will come back to you yeah. uh, and nature mm -hmm. and have a big impact on your life. Okay. And uh, we understand this has been a very successful project mm -hmm. because in addition to the reviews, the positive reviews you have received, you have been recognized in many of the leading awards and recognitions uh, in the film industry, mm -hmm. including the 2015 New York Festival you know, for the uh, World Gold you know, Medal uh, recognition, mm -hmm. and also in 2014, the Jackson, you know, Jackson Hole you know, Wildlife Film Festival. And uh, this is not easy. You know, Al, you know, it's also a big credit to you and your production team. And let me ask you, what do all these awards and recognitions and honors uh, mean to you? Mm. I think um, there are a lot of good films out there. Okay. Um, and just by virtue of sheer volume, mm. um, you know, things get forgotten. Good films get forgotten. Mm. And what the awards do for the film and for me in certain ways by extension is that um, you know, people can remember it and they can more, more importantly, not the, remember the issues that we tried to okay. reach in the films. Good. And so um, <laughs> I'm very gratified that, you know, we were able to receive these recognitions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I hope that as a result of it, more people could watch it yeah. and the people who watch it will remember it better so that they can maybe use some of the knowledge, apply it, apply it to their daily lives or, okay. Uh, maybe take action in mm -hmm. their own small ways by eating organic or mm -hmm. maybe, you know, helping trying to spread the um, sort of knowledge about chemicals and what they do to your body. Good. Mm -hmm. And uh, how was the experience of working with Taiwan's PTS? Mm -hmm. I understand that this is a project, one of the few they have done, and then certainly, uh, you know, sort of like an international local cooperation 
on this, you know, in this area, and uh, what what is experience like? Uh, it was very good, a uh, very okay. very positive one. Um, okay. They left um, a lot of creative freedom to me mm -hmm. and um, editorial freedom as well. Okay. And um, you know, I would report to them. This is what I th I'm thinking of doing, and they're very supportive. Uh, the whole sort of U.S. trip as well. Okay. Um, basically, I brought it to them during the during the research stage and okay. they uh, they said that oh, that's very important we need to support that mm -hmm. support your trip because that's a crucial part of of um, trying to get the story and mm -hmm. so um, all in all they've been very uh, very helpful and I all think right. for PTS as well uh, it was a big undertaking because normally films that are partly shot overseas they work with a, a foreign broadcaster Okay. Um, and they sort out that end, mm -hmm. and you know they film for us, or and then for PTS, and then they you know bring it together. But mm -hmm. this was a 100% PTS undertaking yes. to go all the way to the U.S. to mm -hmm. the East Coast and run around in the U.S. and trying to find things. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I think it was a overall very positive. Definitely, yes. definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And finally, before we end this part of the program, mm -hmm. in the process of cooperating with a local team, mostly you know from the PTS, did you find there are areas maybe that in the future, uh, by based on the pattern and the experience that you have accumulated, that you are able to you know improve upon? You know, for example, maybe for some of the local you know team members to get a better taste and experience about what the international audiences are looking for. Mm -hmm. And conversely, maybe for the international team or the, you know, the marketplace to understand that, hey, we do have quality you know, stories, people, you know, staff, and also support you know, to undertake such a you know, you know, scale, such a you know, huge project and that can make Taiwan and then also PTS in the process visible on the international stage. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Sure. I think um, part of the, the whole purpose of doing things, um, because I'm a foreigner, mm -hmm. and then the, for them to hire me as an, a director to work with them is um, yes. knowledge transfer. Okay, uh, so I can mm -hmm. bring my experiences to the team, mm -hmm. the local team, okay. uh, and they can learn from me. And at the same time, I can learn from them as well. Okay. Uh, but I think um, a lot of the... Um, content um, in terms of, because this was a science film, mm -hmm. um, and I've worked on a couple with the BBC as well, okay. but the way we do research, um, and also the way we try to uh, visualize it in the film, yes. uh, because often these technical scientific films become, mm -hmm. we don't want it to become a dry textbook no. kind of film, and so okay. how do we ma make it more attractive to the general audience? Exactly. Um, and these things I think I was able to impart to the local team and from the local Good. team I think mm -hmm. I learned a lot about Taiwan mm. uh, the nature and the people uh, who work here and how because it's a small place they have to coexist with nature and mm -hmm. take care of it um, and that, that kind of uh, spirit and passion I think I, I was able to uh, understand yeah. better. Yeah I think it's also very important that this sets a very good example for, you know, in the future, anybody who wants to do an international local joint project, uh, this would be a very good experience in terms of building a confidence for the locals and also building a confidence for the international marketplace. Yes. <laughs> now we're talking about, you know, some of the works that you have done in the past. Also, let's, you know, discuss a little bit about your experiences at BBC, you know, BBC News from the years 2003 all the way up to 2011. What was your capacity? Uh, how was the experience, you know, you know, to you? I mean, did it help in terms of subsequently, you know, doing other things? Please. Sure. Uh, I think uh, it's a job that entailed a lot of different facets okay. of production, and mm -hmm. so uh, okay. I think my job was called a video producer. Um, Good. And it mm -hmm. depended on. There was a lot of video producers within BBC, and a lot of it depended on what you did depended on your strengths and weaknesses. Um, I happened to be able to film well, and so I was also the director of photography, mm -hmm. and I also directed things, okay. uh, and I also edited 
uh, so I, I know how to uh, do post. Need to do everything. Yes. Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And what were kind of you know some some of the you know stories that you covered mm -hmm. while you were you know BBC? Well, I understand it's uh, a lot on current affairs, on mm -hmm. some of the social developments and things. What were some of the things that came into mind? Sure. I think when we think of news, um, you know, there's we often imagine bombs blowing up yeah. and you know guns firing and mm. so on and so forth but okay. uh, China is very different in a sense that things don't happen in an explosive way no rather mm. they come in small incremental ste steps and so mm. it's as though it's water dripping and so our job and BBC was to uh, figure out what that was ha what was happening so okay. it was quite okay. investigative Okay, good. Did you find that to be very different from the earlier experience that you had at Reuters? Yes, very much so. Uh, okay. Reuters was very much uh, straight up. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it maybe you know you can call it superficial, mm -hmm. uh, but whatever happened, we just went and recorded it. Okay. Um, so if something uh, was going on, we would just try to get there and mm -hmm. grab the shots and then okay. tell what, just show what was going on. But at the BBC. Uh, we actually had to get underneath the skin and okay. dig out what was really happening and look at things in a longer time frame. Okay. Maybe not just a day or even weeks, but months and years and try to uncover what's going on. All right. And Al, you mentioned you know, a lot of the investigation that was needed mm -hmm. you know, before the story was actually you know, told. And uh, I understand that one of the projects that you did was on the illegal organ transplant. Mm -hmm. you know, from some of death row inmates in China mm -hmm. uh, onto the patients, you know, implant patients. And the project subsequently won you the International Amnesty Award, and uh, certainly was a big recognition. Uh, I would suppose that there was a lot of hard work, a lot of the uh, investigation went into it. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that experience behind the project, and uh, also receiving that award, what did it mean to you and your team? Mm. Yeah, that was a very tough one. Uh, mm. We knew it was going on, yes. uh, but it was very hush-hush. Yeah. Uh, we had to snoop around hospitals and actually pose as um, uh, people who wanted organ transplants. Um, but the, uh, their guard is very tight, and so you have to uh, keep going and mm. winning their trust. But the shocking thing was it was being done in an industrial scale. So it wasn't just isolated one or two, but it, we're talking okay. about dozens. Because okay. uh, China executes more prisoners mm. than the rest of the world combined. Yeah. And mm. so there is always a dark side to something that's happening. And this, is, this was one such situation mm. where uh, you know, the organs, especially liver and kidneys, were okay. being taken. Yeah. Uh, from these prisoners and being sold okay. um, in state-sanctioned hospitals. Uh, and it, qu it kicked up quite a fuss, and it um, focused a lot of attention on, mm -hmm. you know, the rights of prisoners. Yes. And it, by extension, uh, the legal system in China. Is it fair? Is it, are, they, are they, you know, receiving a fair trial? And do they actually do due, due mm. process, mm. transparency. And so... I think um, it cut to a lot of di different uh, angles, yes. so, and so um, uh, it was an intersection of a lot of different issues, and right. I think um, we came at the right time, and um, we're gratified to know that um, that award brought more attention to the, to the issue. issue. Yes. Subsequently, some of the policies were changed mm, um, okay. in China, and so in a very, very small minute way, I think maybe we're able to contribute a little little bit to their yeah. uh, social development. All right, you're very modest. Ah. And uh, uh, let me ask you, I mean, while you were doing all these investigation and then subsequently getting the project off and then the whole world knows about the issue and things, did that make your subsequent work you know, at BBC News in China a lot more difficult? Because, uh, you know, people can say, hey, this uh, Mr. Go is doing, you know, some, you know, uh, investigative work on uh, some of the things that we are, you know, hush hush about, and then uh, we should be, you know, paying more attention to what, you know, Mr. Go and his team are doing next. Did that ever 
come across as a concern? Yeah, China, I think, <laughs> is a very interesting place because uh -huh. a lot of people from the outside look upon the government and the whole system as a monolith. So, okay. um, you know, they say they, they see one face okay. um, of China, but actually within it, there are a lot of different um, government officials, uh, different views amongst politicians. Okay. And so uh, they do actually have a, a true desire to mm -hmm. make the society better and not just cover things up. Okay. And so um, there's always this push and pull. Um, there are certain elements, I believe, in the government who would mm -hmm. like to shut, the, shut us down and yes. make sure that these stories don't get out. No. But there are mm -hmm. more uh, enlightened people in the government who, who understand the need for these things to be covered so that actually improvement can take place. And right. so, um, yes, uh, there are certain times, politically sensitive times, when we are followed around, our mm. phones were tapped, uh, and you know, wherever we went, we had a tail, yes. um, so on and so forth. But um, we always knew that there was a balance and that they, you know, they may try to stop us, but there are also people within the government in mm -hmm. China that w that wanted these things covered as well. So okay, it's um, it's always sort of trying to feel your way through. Exactly. Um, it's not so black and white. No. Okay. Well, at the time, were you married or have a family and things? I mean, did the family, you know, cons you know, were they worried about, you know, your well-being? Mm -mm. You know, to be honest with you, um, the worst that can happen to a foreign Journalists, journalists is, get kicked is to out. get kicked out. Yes. So our risk is fairly limited. Um, Good. And we may, we may not be able to go back forever, <laughs> or okay. there are different kinds of sort of ways that they categorize you. Some people can, okay. after a few years, are allowed back. Some people are exiled. Banned forever. Banned <laughs> forever. <laughs> yes. So I, I was more concerned about our staff, local staff in the office. Precisely, and yes. Yeah, I think in the run-up to the 2008 Olympics, um, Really, there, there was an atmosphere where China was freeing up a lot of the, the old restrictions. And um, they really wanted to, in earnest, they wanted improvement and things. There was a lot more press freedom. Uh, even local media were able to cover things that in the past, maybe even two they or three years do. before that, couldn't do. Okay. And so um, uh, I think this organ transplant story came just as things were sort of becoming mm -hmm. freer. Good. Um, but subsequently, after the Olympics, um, they've tightened up again. And so they come in sort of waves. So they, there's a period of, you know, freedom, and then, and then they tighten up, and then you have to sort okay. of buckle down. Things get harder, and people you want to interview don't, you know, they don't, don't accept you. your yes. mm -hmm. invitation. And, mm -hmm. And then it comes back, and it, a lot of these, these things come and go. Go through cycles and mm -hmm. things. Let's talk a little bit about another project that you did called White Horse Village. Mm -hmm. uh, that subsequently won you the Peabody and also Emmy Awards. Tell us a little bit about the story and also, uh, again, what the awards mean to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, um, it was, I was really lucky to be able to work on that project mm -hmm. because... Okay. It's a rare sort of opportunity where you can keep going back to your characters mm -hmm. in the same place over many years. Mm -hmm. And um, originally, um, uh, a good friend of mine in the BBC, she's a presenter, um, Carrie Gracie, um, okay. we were talking about, and uh, a producer from Newsnight, which is one of their uh, current affairs programs. Mm -hmm. um, we were chatting about doing a program like this, and it just, again, uh, it just happened to fall at the right time and right place. China, in the run-up to the Olympics, people were interested. Mm. And so the program okay. decided to commit that budget to, for us to let us go film, film it and keep going back year after year. Okay. Um, and so what we wanted to do was to record, I think um, a lot of the foreign audience have seen Beijing, Shanghai, mm -hmm. and the bigger cities and development and what's happening. But they had a... Um, you know, very little exposure to what was happening in the countryside. And in some way, that was more monumental than what was happening in the cities. Exactly. So we picked a, t picked a little city, uh, town. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it was a f um, farming village. Mm. Uh, but the government had a plan to set that up as a county seat. And so um, they decided to pour a lot of fun funding and build it up. And 
and what we want, we wanted to sh we wanted to see how the people live there against this background, how their lives changed, and we followed a couple characters uh, over the years. And you know, there, there, there were little kids who were maybe this tall. Yes. And then by the time we'd gone back again the last time, 2010, mm -hmm. uh, they were already grown up and they were you know, exactly. going to elementary school. Uh -huh. um, and so, um, yeah, I think that was the success of that film mm -hmm. was because it was such a normal situation mm -hmm. in China and it was yes. so representative of what was happening yes. in the countryside. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We need. We were talking about some of the projects that you have done in the past, and then I also asked you, you know, earlier, what are some of the qualities that you felt necessary uh, for documentary filmmaker? And uh, besides that, I'm going to ask you also, what do you think are some of the necessary elements, you know, for a successful documentary film to have, you know, in addition to the qualities of the documentary director? Please. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think documentary films are very much a reflection of who you are as, okay. a, as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. your perspectives, mm -hmm. um, your values, okay. and so forth, okay. so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, you know, what you're interested in is very important. As I mentioned before, curiosity, mm -hmm. um, digging underneath the surface, trying to find out what's really going on. Yes. Um, and uh, on top of it, you need a passion for storytelling. It's like, how do you tell the story? Um, and it's very much a uh, process of communication and interaction with your uh, characters and subjects mm -hmm. in the film. Mm -hmm. And you have to have uh, an ability to connect with people. Yes. Uh, these are some of, um, some of the most important qualities. Because if your characters in films, even in science films or okay. technical films, they really make or break your film. If your character is boring, then uh, the audience is not going to resonate with them and okay. they're going to feel bored and they might change the channel or stop watching. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to make it uh, alive and you have, you have to develop a sense for it. I think some, it's, uh, it's something that you, you nurture as a okay. filmmaker. Okay. Uh, and I think um, uh, being able to connect with your audience um, and understanding what they would like to see mm -hmm. of this character or about the story, what's useful for them, mm -hmm. what's, what could provide insight into mm -hmm. perhaps their own lives. Okay. Um, and so these are uh, very important qualities. Empathy, I think, is, is quite important. All right. And, uh, you know, in Taiwan, we, we have a lot of, you know, local filmmaking, a lot of TV production and things, but there isn't so much attention paid to documentary, you know, filmmaking in Taiwan. But this is a very international market, also very competitive. In your opinion, after working in different places over the years, how do you think that Taiwan can become more competitive and earn a, you know, a place, a presence in the international documentary filmmaking market? Mm. I think um, there's a lot of passion amongst uh, film, local filmmakers here. Good. And sometimes it's a bit, little bit unfocused. Okay. And they think, uh, mm -hmm. oh, this is a great story. And then they'll go and follow somebody for three years and continue mm -hmm. filming and filming after day after day. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, it's, uh, it's important for them to understand the purpose of the film. Okay. What are you trying to say? Uh, mm -hmm. Don't just follow someone. Mm -hmm. Is what's so special about them, and then concentrate on those aspects and not film too much. Because okay. if you have too many uh, footage, then it's it's uh, it's really difficult to edit it. Of so, course. And also um, thinking about the audience. What does the audience take away from your film? You okay. don't want it just to be some uh, an exercise in self satisfaction. Okay. Um, <laughs> You need to understand what's useful for them, what provides them insight, perhaps into their own lives by through watching your film. Mm -hmm. And so these things from a storytelling perspective, I think need to be addressed by okay. local directors and production companies. Okay. And, and from a funding standpoint, I think um, there are some initiatives um, and there are mm -hmm. also uh, sort of uh, private sort of foundations mm -hmm. and also corporations that help underwrite some of these um, documentary films, mm -hmm. but it really needs uh, public and, and government support okay. for it to 
become a um, you know aspect, a strong aspect in in um, television film uh, television. All right. And uh, Al, do you think that in order to better nurture the local talents uh, to be involved, engaged in documentary filmmaking, that it would be advisable for them to maybe, for example, take some short-term courses uh, at a different country in the U.S. or in Europe, for example, and also go to some of these international film festivals. You know, be exposed and also get some exposure from others. You know, see how other people around the world are doing their storytelling, uh, what is lacking you know, for us here in Taiwan. Do you think those are the recommended steps? Mm -hmm. I think those are very important. But um, mm -hmm. there are some differences between Western okay. sort of filmmaking, so-called right. education or process, and mm -hmm. Eastern processes. Okay. All right. In that, in the West, generally people are encouraged not to take courses in films or okay. measure it filmmaking mm -hmm. or uh, media or news. Um, they like people to have a more uh, liberal arts, uh, sort of a, a wider sort of education mm -hmm. um, and develop their independent sort of ways of analyzing things and okay. being able to think on your own. All right. And I think I feel that's a good way as well, rather than concentrating too much on the technical aspects mm -hmm. of filmmaking, maybe camera work or editing. These things, I think you can learn on the job. And I think the most important thing is to do it. Um, okay rather than sort of talking too much about theory and, and trying to learn, learn from textbooks. And mm -hmm. so jumping in and doing it, and then uh, in the process you figure things out yourself. Okay. And, and that's, I think, the most important thing. And, right. and as an extension of that, I mm -hmm. think it's important to um, uh, these film festivals. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of good films out there. There are forums mm -hmm. where you can sit in on and listen to you know mm -hmm. people who've done it before talk about how they dealt with certain scenes or mm -hmm. you know situations including fundraising okay. um, and that can be invaluable experience to local filmmakers. Right. Al you have had the experience of working with local teams and local members uh, do you think among the younger generation of prospective filmmakers in Taiwan is there growing interest you know, to try to get into documentary filmmaking first before they pick up some of the you know, dramatic projects. You know, what is, is there a natural or logical sequence in doing that? I think everybody has a very different uh, path? developmental path okay. trajectory. Right. Um, some people come from this background, other people come from that, and mm -hmm. then they end up in filmmaking. So I think that's actually good um, right. because people have as I said before, it's a reflection of who you are. So the more different kinds of backgrounds people have, the richer the whole body of documentary films that are coming out from Taiwan will become. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think um, uh, from, um, from that perspective, it's um, each according to their own, his okay. or her own. Okay. Um, and again, no particular process. Um, it's, you might be, you know, like a math major, for, for example, but then mm. suddenly you become interested. And that's actually great, I think. And, terrific. And mm. you might be literature like myself, which mm. actually have quite a lot um, of similarity to filmmaking. Mm. One's textual, one's visual, but the storytelling concepts are, mm. are actually all the same. Mm. So um, I bring that kind of background to filmmaking, whereas somebody in math or somebody in science has a... Okay. something different that they bring to filmmaking. Good. And now you are now currently the uh, executive producer for Taiwan China at the National Geographic Channel. Uh, as far as you can tell and share with us, what are some of the projects that we can expect from National Geographic Channel in the coming months or years? Sure, Please. sure. Mm. Uh, we have a very big uh, series coming up in the summer called The Fighter Pilots. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we had really good access to the um, fighter pilot training school down in Gangshan, okay. near um, Kaohsiung. Mm. Uh, and so we followed a group of um, stu um, cadets who okay. were, you know, who went through uh, basic training, who couldn't fly at all first. Okay. And then they start, start on propeller 
uh, training mm -hmm. planes, and then they graduate. And it's a very, very tough program. So mm -hmm. a lot of them get um, whittled down, and then yeah. and then they have to leave the program because they didn't make the grade. Okay. And so uh, with it, and then we follow them all the way through to when they change the jet jet fighter training jets, mm -hmm. and then they graduate from the school. Okay. Um, and I think. Um, there's a lot of drama in it, um, and there's a lot of uh, adrenaline, um, okay. <laughs> lots of speed, and okay. and it's a tough world. And how you know Taiwan, uh, from the perspective of the Air Force, how they train their uh, you know young uh, sort of up and coming talent to be able cool. to defend okay. Taiwan. Yeah, mm -hmm. and finally, before we end the program today, Al, mm -hmm. we understand that you have done you know so much and also been recognized so many times for your work in you know, documentary filmmaking. If I may ask, what's next for you? I mean, are you looking forward to doing more projects in documentary filmmaking? Or are we likely to see you know, you know, doing a dramatic project in the coming you know, few years? Mm -hmm. I think there's generally a uh, sort of conversion between drama and documentary because mm -hmm. in documentary films if we do a historical documentary films we're right. not able to film what happened in the past so we no. do a lot of reenactments mm. and so uh, documentary is taking on a lot of the elements of of drama as well Good. and so right. uh, there's there's a general sort of convergence mm -hmm. and so it could be a natural progression of things and there are new genres called docudramas. Oh, and so yeah. right. uh, it's sort of like what I just mentioned in a way that um, uh, we try to reenact and tell the story, uh, you know, factual programming or factual stories in a dramatic way. Good. And that's, that's, uh, it's right. a new, new genre that's catching on. It's truly been a delight to have you on the program today, Al. Mm -hmm. I certainly want to wish you all the best in your professional and personal endeavors in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching our program today. I'll see you next time on Macroview Television. Thank you.